Hey, thanks for listening to the show. I want to talk about our friends at Just Live CBD. Support for RacerX and this podcast is brought to you by Just Live CBD. They're a trusted source for high-quality wellness CBD products created by athletes just for you. Fun fact, Travis Pastrana, ever heard of him? He may or may not know a few things about being injured, recovery, dealing with nagging pains, nagging injuries. Well, Travis is actually one of the founders of Just Live CBD, so that's pretty neat. Travis and everybody at Just Live CBD want to hook you guys up. You can get 30% off your entire order with code RACERX at checkout. Visit JustLive.com. That's J-U-S-T-L-I-V-E, JustLive.com, and use code RACERX to get 30% off your entire order. Welcome, Welcome to the Moto Marketing Podcast, presented by Racer X, the podcast for moto industry professionals, entrepreneurs, and riders. If you want to grow your brand and business in today's digital first world, you have to know how to turn a stranger into a fan, turn a like into a customer. You have to know how to turn attention into dollars. This podcast is dedicated to keeping you in the know on real marketing tactics that work in the moto world so that you grow your business and help grow the sport. Get ready to learn from the very same marketing experts trusted by Racer X, Lucas Oil Pro Motocross, GNCC, and NBC Sports. They'll help you navigate the world of digital marketing for your moto brand. This is the Moto Marketing Podcast. Podcast. Presented by Racer X. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Nessler. We got a great guest for you today. Um, somebody that I, I think you guys will enjoy. Um, it's what he he's got a cool job. I mean, it's you know working for a cool brand and and working with some uh, some teams and athletes that we all know and love. Um, and I'm excited to learn more about him. We have Chris Meyer from Maxis with us today. Chris, welcome to the show, man. I appreciate you being on with us. Thanks. I appreciate it. It should be fun. Yeah, man. So uh, I was introduced to you via Jason Y. Gant. Every once in a while, Weege will reach out to me and say, hey, man, I got a great podcast um, guest for you. And he's never let me down. So I shot you a text and or called you and you were like, man, I'd love to come on and uh yeah, dude, I, it's, I, I'm just curious to learn more about you and um, kind of you told me briefly on the call that, you know, you, you, you come from the, the alcohol space. So I'm curious to kind of hear about your background and how you got into the moto space and what exactly your role and just your responsibilities are, Max. So we'll kind of dive into that. Um, let's I mean, I guess I, I usually like to start here as far as uh, your background. Have you always been a moto fan? Is it is it a sport that you just kind of learned to love more recently than not, or where where are we at with that? I'm definitely a diehard, lifelong moto fan. Um, uh, through uh, my best friend, I had to, yeah, still my best buddy um, to this day, but from T-ball, his old man um, was a big time into moto, and so I actually. Like my dad wasn't into dirt bikes or anything at all. Like I played t-ball, I played the regular stick and ball sports, and uh, Mr. Debsky was just diehard into moto, like old school. Think like seventies metal tank, you know, dual shock moto. Yeah. And so I learned to ride on some like I don't know, like Wallenberg would cuss me for not knowing <laughs> what I learned to ride on, but um, some huge steel tank thing i couldn't i could barely reach the pegs you know mr d would like i would let the clutch out and i would go and then i would come back and he would catch the front fender because there's no way in hell i could touch the ground um at that at like or whatever i was like eight or nine uh i definitely have a moto a little moto dude stature so uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> throttle jockey for sure but yeah I mean, so i've always been a fan i mean i was blessed to be you know in I was born in 81, so I'm I'm 39 now. So, like, the 90s and, and early 2000s was, like, the heyday for me of, of growing up. And so to, you know, follow uh, the arcs of McGrath and then, you know, Carmichael and on and on down the list of just what an epic era to grow up in, you know. 
um, to get to go to one of the first U.S. Opens and see that whole experience and, and just a lot of really cool to me, I, everybody says this. Everybody says the decade where they kind of came of age was the best decade of moto, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not complaining about the one that I did in yeah. the '90s. And then, and then to turn around and now I work with Jeremy, right? You know, job like this dude that I looked up to as a kid is is pretty rad. Yeah. That, yeah. That's got to be. I mean, so we work with, uh, we've worked with Arma for, for some time now and, uh, Arma supports the e-bike team that I run and we we do their marketing and man, I remember when we had a conference call and they said, Jeremy's going to join us today. And I was like, uh, yeah, it was just right. surreal. And then, you know, Davey Coombs and I are good friends and we were having drinks one night and he was telling me some, you know, he's like, man, you should get this person on that person on. And he just, he just shared Jeremy's cell phone number with me. And I, I so, like, <laughs> I sat on it forever and I'm like, and I call people for a living. Like I'm a sales guy. Right. right? So, right, right, and I was right. like, I was, I never called Jeremy's cell phone. Cause I'm like, I can't, you can't, you can't call like, you can't call the king. <laughs> so I still have it. And, and I know him from Arma and whatever, but yeah, it, it's, it's cool yeah. when you're, when you're a fan of the sport and you get to be able to work in it, that those first few interactions with guys that were and are your heroes is definitely is surreal. How, so you had mentioned to me, you were in a different industry. Uh, you mentioned to me on a call before we got on the show, you were in a different industry. Um, before you got into moto Ta- that is a very hot, question that I get asked by just listeners and they usually reach out to me on Instagram wanting to get into the sport. So it usually doesn't happen where you get out of college and you just get right into the sport. You usually start somewhere else and kind of work your way in. What What's kind of right. your journey? How did you get into, is Maxis your first gig in moto? Did you get in a different way? Let's walk through that if you don't mind. Yeah. So um, I, when I graduated from college, I went to University of Georgia, Terry College of Business, business management degree. I graduated in 05, and uh, two of my buddies had started a boat manufacturing company, and I jumped on with them and worked with them for a couple years, kind of managing uh, their service department and uh, you know, not getting paid. None of us were getting paid, but we did wakeboard every day at three, <laughs> so... I guess that that was worth it at the time. But um, when I decided I need a real paycheck, I kind of stumbled into the uh, alcohol industry. And at that age, it was just like my dining room. My dining room at the time didn't have a dining room table. It just had a two keg kegerator in it. It was just you know bachelor paradise. And uh, <laughs> I look back on it now, I'm like, what was I thinking? But uh, but um, you know. The, so no, I didn't jump right into moto. I'd always been a moto kid and, um, loved, loved moto and rode all through high school and into college. And then like, really when I started grinding in the alcohol business, I did kind of like step away from writing and, and, um, you know, I really just dove head first into my career and trying to, you know, that's the kind of industry where the, I mean, there are many like this, but that industry for sure, the more out you can put in as many hours as you want. And it's kind of like running your own little franchise. Right. And you can, you can really affect your, your bottom line revenue for yourself personally with busting your ass. Yeah. Um, that that's where I typically shine. Um, and so it was a good fit for me at the time. Yeah, that's rad. So as far as your role with, with Maxis, kind of talk to me about what, um, cause that's a cool gig. I mean, that's, that's one of the most iconic, uh, brands in the sport in cycling and, and, you know, just every, everybody knows Maxis. Um, right. what, what do you get to do? And it's obviously you got a cool job. What does that entail? Um, it entails a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot more than the original job description did. I can tell you that much. <laughs> That's funny um, how that works, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me double back to finish actually answering the question you asked before real quick. Um, so I did a little over a decade in the alcohol industry and, uh, I had shifted from working from a distributor to working from a manufacturer okay. and had had kids and gotten married during that time. And, um, at some point, uh, I'll just, uh, bluntly, like I got burned out and I just couldn't do the thought of having to travel and go to bars every night actually was like miserable to me. Um, and so I knew 
I knew I needed out of that industry. It just wasn't fun. And I really, so I actually quit. Um, and uh, I don't think the company I was working for really was disappointed that I quit, like that we parted ways. Like we were not on the same page uh, at the time. And so I had some time luckily uh, to where I could sit and think. And I was like, if I make a move, I'm going to make a move that is a long-term goal and I want to reinvest in broadening my skill set. And uh, I'd spent, I my last position there was managing Georgia and Alabama um, total market. Uh, so there's a ton of marketing involved in that and then obviously the whole sales piece side of it. And I've always been more on the sales side of business and less on the marketing side, but I'm probably more creative than sales allow space for a lot of times. And so I wanted to move into more of a marketing uh, minded position. And so with that in mind, I happen to just, I'm looking around going, what industries do I want to be in? I definitely know I'm plugged in an alcohol, but I'm burnt out on that industry. I don't really like a lot of people in that industry. And that was when I happened to pop back over to Maxis and see what they had available. And they had um, this uh, power sports specialty marketing position that was open. And I knew it would be it would be underpaying out of the box for me versus what I was ma making in the um, alcohol industry. And my hope was that as uh, I also didn't have every piece of skill set that would be needed right out of the box or at least on paper. I knew I had the skills. I just didn't have them on paper per se. Um, so that was the transition. Um into into and then I, of course I got that position. So now I'm I'm a senior uh, marketing coordinator for uh, Power Sports. I basically handle the whole, you know, all of Power Sports, and I work a lot with automotive, uh, and then the bicycle team as well. Um, so my role at Maxis, uh, it you know I do all the ad insertion orders. Uh, we have a really small team, um, but we work together. Uh, with creative agencies to develop our campaigns. Um, we handle all of our digital spends. We collaborate with the uh, sponsorship teams on event sponsorship, uh, athlete uh, activation and sponsorship. And, you know, um, really as many hats as I want to put on, they'll let me put on. Sure. Uh, so, you know, the skill set that I'm really trying to master is, is saying no yeah. and not doing a bunch of things half assed, but doing the things that matter the most yeah, at 100. So yeah. something that I've noticed the last few years is Maxis has started to make a, uh, a, a bigger push to become a, you guys are like one of the names in cycling. And I, I feel like you've really started to try to push more into the moto space and, you know, the development of the, the tire with Jeremy and uh, right. getting involved with teams. What, is, what has that been like? And what's it been like to work on a team that you're trying, you know, you've, you're really strong in one market, you're in another market, but you're, you know, you're trying to be one of the name, like the biggest names in that market too. What, what is that like to, I guess, probably lead that team, um, to really try and, and, and grow the awareness and, and just the, the share the, the, how much ground you guys own in, in that space. What's that been like? It, um, you know, it's interesting because Maxis has a ton of advantages versus a lot of its competition with, um, the, the groundwork that's been laid by the bicycle department. Um, you know, in automotive and power sports, uh, you know, there's, there's tons of room for growth, uh, specifically in two wheel and four wheel, we crush in power sports, you know, side by side in ATV racing, you know, all the, the last, I don't know, decade of championships in ATV and max have all been on Max's tires, you know, um, we have, you know, 30, 40 plus GNCC XC1 pro quad championships, you know. Uh, there's plenty of accolades on the four wheel side of things. And we're very, very well known in that. Um, whether it's, you know, uh, out West and works or here, you know, on the East coast and, and GNCC. Um, so it really is specifically just in the moto space, which happens to be the most visible of all power sports. I mean, you can think about races that have a lot more money in them, like Baja 1000 or, you know, Dakar and, and some of these off-road events that are just global, global events. Um, but they don't get, 
you know, the consistent eyeballs that Supercross specifically gets. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of the appeal of that space. Do we want to be, are we, is, is my vision that we're going to, you know, have a full blown support rig in Supercross parked next to, you know, some of our competitors now, um, you know, do we want to be in the space and converting people to, um, our lifestyle and really, you know, that's the fun thing about this brand. It's challenging too, because with bicycle, you know, automotive, moto, four wheel stuff, those customers are all very similar. The bicycle customer is quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of crossover from power sports to bicycle, but people that started out in bicycle are only now just now in the last couple of years starting to cross over into power sports type thing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you look at like the resistance, uh, to e-bikes for instance, by a lot of the endemic hardcore folks in the bicycle side of things. Um, so it does, you know, some of the things that we could do in the power sports space, just will not work as a slogan or a branding point in the bicycle space. They will be offensive in that space. Yeah. So it it does to stay on brand, you know, company wide, it it is a little, that is challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's also our benefit is that, you know, whatever you do, we have a blast at what we do but we do it at an elite level and whatever you do, you can pick up a high performance product from us for it. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, you know, when I started, you know, kind of looking around you're going, man, like the bicycle people that use our products are diehard. The ATV people that use our products are diehard. The moto people that use our products, like it. we make a desert tire. That's pretty darn good. Um, they're diehard about it and on and on down the list. But, Do those people have Max's bicycle tires on their bicycle? Do they even know it's the same company? Sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, So how can we strengthen the crossover within Endemic to create a better culture and lifestyle that then becomes the ambassador evangelical platform to help push out beyond Endemic into mainstream? Yeah. Or to, to people that aren't familiar with the brand. Yeah, it's so first off, we're going to take a quick break and we come back. I want to dive right back into this because this is uh, it's not often that we get somebody on the show that we're called the Moto Marketing Podcast. Right. But a lot of times the people we have on, they're not the guys that have their hands in the marketing pot and they don't really want to talk too deep about it. So we talk about business. So when we get an opportunity to dive deep into something that is complex like this, it's a, it's a cool opportunity. So when we come back, I, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this as far as you guys have one brand that really you, you have these different products and, and, and each one of those products brings a different per type of person to it. So how do we talk to all those people so that what you just said happens? You got somebody that's in moto, but how do, how do I get their, my tires on their truck? How do I get, make sure that they're riding our bicycle tires? Um, we're going to dive into that a little bit deeper when we come back. Um, stick around. Fly Racing's 2021 line has been improved and expanded, offering the industry's widest range of moto and off-road products. Led by the revolutionary Formula Helmet featuring Rion technology, Fly Racing has taken big steps forward with the all-new Light Pant, and Zone Pro Goggle. It's going to debut this year at the Monster Energy Supercross by Justin Brayton and the Muckoff Honda team. The Zone Pro Goggle delivers premium performance from a brand you know and trust, Fearless Pursuit, fly racing it's personally the gear that i wear i've worn it moto bmx mountain bike i've worn it and repped it for years in my opinion it's the best be sure to check out their goggle their helmet and all their gear fly racing Hey, big shout out to our friends at FMF. Uh, Little D and the guys are always doing some pretty exciting things, not just with the performance products, but man, they've got the coolest apparel in the game. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to get that at a little bit of a discount. If you go to FMF and, and, and pick up any gear you'd like, hats, shirts, whatever it is, upon checkout, if you enter the code MMP30, MMP30, you can get 30% off. So M M P three zero at checkout and get 30% off your order on FMF apparel. All right. Welcome back to the Moto marketing podcast. We got Chris Meyer from Maxis uh, and Chris for 
we took a quick break. You were talking about, you know, a goal that you guys have and, and that's making sure that look, we, you know, we, we make premium level tires and, and, you know, we might have John who has it on his motorcycle, but how do I make sure he gets it on his, um, on his, uh, on his on his truck and then how do i make sure that the mountain bike that specialized epic that he has has the maxis tires on that um what are some of the things you guys have done and do you i mean do you you obviously work with influencers in a way i mean you have ambassadors more or less like mcgrath and then you have teams you know you've got alex ray and these guys that um are well known but beyond that, I mean, are you do you guys lean in and do stuff with traditional media, your print and things like that? Do you have a strong digital plan? What does that look like to really try to reach out and cross pollinate across different markets? Well, I think, you know, as pretty much everybody's done at this juncture, you know, there has been a huge shift away. Obviously, we I do still support some of traditional media and print very, you know, sparingly. It's more out of I, you know, I love racer X, so we, we keep them, we support them. Um, but you know, has a large portion of our budget shifted to digital shifted to social? Of course it has. It's, you know, we would not be spending our dollars wisely if we didn't. Um, and so in doing that, you know, spending time to figure out what our audiences are or drill down to how to reach the right people. Um, by more than just a national broad sweeping stroke and spend the time to, to divvy things up by region or by um, channel and see where the crossover is and target those things. Um, you know, we have shifted with the crazy thing is, you know, as we're making this shift, then you have this huge disruption of supply chain and this massive surge in supply to where, you almost have to rein back some of your marketing plans just because you don't have the product to support it. And, you know, if you're launching, whether you're launching a brand new tire or just a new size of a tire or just advertising, you know, a uh, legacy tire, if you don't have it uh, in stock, you, you're likely to create more bad customer experiences by advertising it than, you know, positive goodwill. Right. So it, it does it's been a really challenging time to keep pushing forward and saying, Hey, it, you know, to the customer, like, Hey, check out this cool brand that, you know, you can attach yourself to, uh, in all of your life, just like you have in mountain biking for forever. Oh, except you can't get it. Mm -hmm. um, right. So it has made that portion a challenge, but you know, if we take a lot of what we've done is, uh, you know, each department has its own budget. So bicycling has uh, the bicycle department has a budget. I have my own marketing budget. Automotive has its own budget. And so whether it's endemic or more at a programmatic level or Google ads level or, or social, instead of each department selfishly only advertising the products that represent their department, it's taking the approach of really, um, well, we did two things. It, you, when I came on, one of the major shifts was instead of each department having their own segmented campaign that looked completely different other than the Maxis logo, we hired an agent, a creative agency to create campaigns, templates that would be used across all segments. So whether you saw an automotive ad, whether you saw uh, an ad with Jeremy or an ad with Axel Hodges or you saw an ad with Greg Minar that the framework, the structure of the ad, the headlines that we used would all um, coincide with each other so that you would see one ad in Bicycle and know that that was the same ad campaign as an ad in a Moto Mac right. or on Racer X. So unifying that look, which is a no brainer. I mean, that's not a slight like marketing genius or anything, <laughs> but you forcing the individual departments with their individual marketing guys to, to have that buy-in to do that. Right. Um, that was one. And then the other thing is then actually having the different departments utilize their dollars that are really only getting measured on bicycle sales, but still promoting the new, 
uh, Razor AT truck tire, which is one of the quietest ATs on the market. Um, you know, why, like, you know, our automotive business is 80 plus percent of our gross revenue in the U S like the, uh, the bicycle and power sports department, like we're not, I mean, we sell a ton of stuff, but sure. you know, versus automotive, it's tiddlywink. So, you know, let's make sure we're taking care of who's really taking care of us. Um, and, uh, those would be the two biggest things that have changed since I've been here. So I think I mean, you say it's a simple concept, and and it is. But I, I think a lot of the people that listen to this show, like, they don't know where to start at all. So the uniformity of your message across multiple platforms, I think, is a is an important takeaway that a lot of people will benefit from. What so how how do you guys tie together your just the multi channel marketing? And for those that aren't marketing nerds like us. Um, how do you tie together the message when you are doing something in racer X print versus if you do something on a racer X podcast versus if you do something on their website and then you start getting into your Facebook ads, your Instagram ads, your Google, anywhere else that you're marketing. Do you guys look at it from that standpoint as well to uh, make sure that you're continuing to market to your customers across those platforms so that if they, if they, see on this podcast and you're paying and you're not, you're not paying money to be on this podcast, but let's say you're a sponsor of one eraser X's podcast. Is there a plan in place so that if somebody listens to you there, you want to make sure, Hey, we want to make sure we're hitting them on YouTube. We want to make sure we're hitting them on Facebook. What, what does that look like for you guys? Yeah. I mean, for sure. If, uh, you know, as far as in the digital landscape, are we making sure that if someone is visiting pages that we're involved with, that we are, uh, then, um, circling back to them in other areas. Yes. Yeah, for sure. We're doing that. And, and with a, uh, a uniform message. So, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, we have, we don't have the thing that we have had to, uh, admit to ourselves is with the size of our team and the size of our budget. Uh, there is some, part of us that has to go we have to keep it somewhat simple we and you know in the digital space if you have all the time in the world or all the you know resources of man hours i mean you can really dig and and spend a a ton of good valuable time learning um and we don't have the bandwidth to do that depth of of um of digging and learning um so with what we have, you know, whether it's through programmatic, uh, support or through YouTube or, uh, you know, the social platforms that we're involved in, um, our focus is to make sure that, uh, if people encounter us at an event, um, that it has the same feel as it does if they, uh, encounter me or if they, um, come across our Instagram account, um, that kind of our communication is, is somewhat uniform in, in the brand and culture that we represent. Um, and we're, we're starkly different than other competitors in the space. So that makes it easier where we are, we just have the ability to be more flexible and more fun than most of the rest of the, uh, uh, manufacturers in our space, you know? Um, so that makes that somewhat easy, but I don't, I'm really not answering your question, but uh, <laughs> no, it, yeah, but it's, I mean, but what you're saying is, uh, is important. I mean, I think one thing you mentioned is just the band, the bandwidth to do the research to, you know, wrap your head completely around things like, I mean, all the options that are out there, it doesn't matter which one. I mean, it's, right. it's yeah. I mean, so do you guys, um, do you guys do a lot of this internally or do you, do you shop out like, do you, um, like Google, for example, like it, it takes an expert. You can't just expect bill who was doing, you know, graphic design yesterday to start right, running Google right. apps. So do you, and you said you you guys are a smaller, leaner team. Do you guys do a lot of this stuff in internally or do you, do you work with outside vendors, whether they're so designers handle, or whatever? Yeah. We handle all the social media internally. Um, for Google and, uh, our programmatic ad spends, uh, we use a third party. 
gotcha. to help manage that just because it's it, it's so it's so easy with the amount of dollars that we do spend in that to spend them poorly sure. if you're not monitoring it closely yeah. and optimizing it and we just don't have the band that's you know part of becoming a good manager is is learning what you have a good skill set for and what you don't and then handing off the things that you don't have the bandwidth for and that's one that we just don't have the bandwidth and i, I feel fully con- you know confident that we could bring it in-house if we had the manpower it just you know it makes too much sense and it's still you know relatively affordable to use a third party to help us with that i think that's 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 a huge i mean that's a big deal though because a lot of people i mean look i'm in that business to where i'm that guy that you know people will shop certain things out to and there's a lot of people, a lot of businesses, small and medium size, that feel like they need to do everything in house. But that same company doesn't have an issue shopping out their accounting to an accounting expert. Oh, right. But then they think, I need a, I need to learn how to do Facebook ads in house. And and sometimes that's the right thing to do. But a lot of times, and we're talking about a company like Maxis. This is an iconic brand. You guys understand where your guys' limitations are and where you need to turn to experts to do certain things. That's why I was kind of bringing that up because there are a lot of people that reach out to me here in this podcast and they they want advice. And really what they're trying to do is they're trying to save as much money as possible to do as much as they can on their own. And then they don't gain any ground because they're not focusing their efforts to where they're really great. They're trying to learn shit that they don't need to be learning. They can shop that out. We don't do our accounting here. I mean, we have an accountant team that, that works with us. My, my my business partner are probably pretty good. Yeah, they're good. Like my business partner doesn't waste his time trying to to get taxes and stuff ready. We have a team, and people right. that makes sense to people. But when you start having that conversation with them about marketing, they're like, "No, I can learn how to write like fifteen hundred email sequences. It's not a big deal." Like, <laughs> it's yeah. It's, so that's cool that you guys get that, um, and you see the value in work internal work as well as working with experts outside of it. Yeah, and I would say, you know, being that uh, most of us are pretty passionate about this industry, um, you know, and creative, uh, you know, spending our time instead of outsourcing to the same level, you know, say some of our factory gear design stuff or, or, you know, some of the social media stuff or some of the event activation, like this is a little bit more fun. Like if I got to pick one or the other that I'm going to spend my time grinding out, like let me outsource, you know, having to pour over, you know, dealing with Google ads. Right. Or Google right. AdWords. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Like if I had to pick de- doing that over, you know, optimizing digital web ad buys, like I would much rather be yeah. dealing with like, this t shirt's badass. We should order a lot of these. This will sell well. Yeah. You know? That's right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that. You know, and we're guilty of it. Our marketing manager definitely is is great at questioning whether or not spins are worth it or not. But um, we're guilty of trying to do too much in, internally. But sure, it, it is an invaluable thing to learn um, what you you know what you really honestly do have the bandwidth to do. Otherwise, like I said earlier, you just end up doing a bunch of stuff kind of good sure. instead of exceptionally well. Yeah. So as we start to wrap things up, I'm curious to ask, is there something that stands out in your mind that's like a tried and true, you know, this is always a good uh, investment of our time and obviously our money as well. I mean, is event activation valuable for you guys, just digital marketing in general, athlete sponsorship, is there, or is it a combination of a lot of things? Is there anything that really sticks out to you? Can you repeat that question yeah. real quick? I yeah, no, that. no, for sure. Is there anything that you guys are doing that stands out to you as like, man, this this always works well for us, whether it be event activation, you know, like, for example, the World Cup uh, for mountain biking is coming to Snowshoe. Is that like, man, we, we'll be there because we, we can definitely activate people for vehicles, bicycles, motorcycles, or is digital? Like, is there anything that is Maxis as a brand that has always worked well for you guys? Well, we definitely – still uh love uh live events um and i think what we have learned and you've seen uh, not to say um that everything the energy drink brands do is spot on but if i look at what is happening in uh power sports with the side-by-side racing 
you're seeing whether it's OEM or energy drinks or some of the, the players in that space, they don't um, necessarily place the same value on a series championship or a, um, uh, you know, being competitive in racing series. And they place a lot of value on large events that are attended by a lot of people and have a lot of reach um, beyond the actual event. So if you look at the events that Rebel sponsors in the four-wheel space in Crandon off-road fall, Crandon Fall Classic, which is 40 to 60,000 live attendance, um, is featured in Rebel Signature Series, uh, gets the likes of Jeremy McGrath, Brian Deegan, all the big names in short course when they're racing go to that race. Um, you know, Kid Rock uh, a year or two ago did like a, a concert on Friday night. Like it is, forget who they have this year, but it's a name you would know. So that's a big, like, cool event. Um, Vegas Torino as an off-road event is the, the largest desert race in this country. Um, and so to me, when it comes to events, um, as far as what works for us, uh, I think an event that has the right vibe um, that is cool Mm -hmm. and not just i mean now of course they're all cool so you know like uniquely cool i guess is what i'm saying sure. is large um has the uh distribution behind it to have a lot of legs of visibility and residual uh impressions um beyond the live feed or the you know delayed broadcast um those are the types of events that work well for us um in power sports bicycles a little bit different because it is so dominant um in the downhill space so you know us being involved in crank works and things like that like those are places we need to be kind of to they're all they're not a maintenance thing but they kind of are too like we're big enough in that space we need to have a presence at some of those things sure yeah um so the event stuff i would say that for sure um Another funny one that just kind of always catches me, I could post like the most badass picture of Jeremy doing a knack knack or, um, you know, Axel doing some ridiculous whatever stop. It's some just thing that you're like, I don't even know how he does that or whatever badass action picture. And I will get probably twice as many impressions and, and, and twice as much engagement out of what I like to call tire porn. So, uh, <laughs> like an yeah. artsy shot of a tire it, for whatever reason. Um, you know, I mean, it's a product we sell. So, I mean, it does make sense for our page that we would post pictures of tires because as we sell tires. But, you know, um, when you just post a picture of a tire, you're like, oh, my God, like this thing is going bananas. And I just posted this amazing picture of so and so that you know is this <laughs> yeah. globally known athlete, and it, you know, right? It, there's funny things like that that you stumble on where you go, all right, well, this is a little honey hole we can dip into every so often. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think. If there's anything else that just really is is those are two that come to mind. Yeah, no um, doubt. You know, yeah, it's interesting when you. I mean, part of what we have to do for the clients we work for is we have to test creative against other creatives. So like, you know, I, we work with the Lucas oil pro motocross series forever. And I used to always use the example of, you know, you'd think an uh, ad with Cooper Webb blasting a berm or hitting a, a uphill triple at high point that used to be there would kill it. But actually it's a ad that has a photo of Cooper signing an autograph for a little boy and his dad. So it's, it's funny right. the things that like that you're like, Oh, I didn't expect that. So I think that's another takeaway that people can take from this. It's, it really doesn't matter what you think is going to work. You test that, but you ultimately have to yeah. let the audience decide and, and they'll tell you, like you guys have reason for knowing that tire porn works better than, you know, a cool knack knack shot of Jeremy. Right. So you guys right. run with what works. And I think that's important for, for people to understand that. Cause a lot of times you're like, yeah, but I just love that photo. Yeah. You love results. Yeah, yeah. Right. So <laughs> yeah, saying, yeah. what? With that posting schedule, there's time for that photo too. Just for you know, sure. Don't worry. But <laughs> what, so, it is, well, the, the people side of things I think is, you know, you're, I've always said 
you know, in all of this, if we if we can connect with people emotionally then and 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 have an emotional reaction to our brand, that's where we want to be. Um, you know, to move out of m- people making a logical purchase and and being able to identify with our brand. Now, of course, everybody wants to move to that space. That's that's that means you're doing your job well as a marketer. Yeah. If you can if you can move your brand to that space and and to me you know that lifestyle side of things there's a picture of one of our uh, GNCC athletes from uh, a couple years ago that did really really well and he's this skinny little kid with like 14 calyx across the front of his head and uh, he podiumed an XC1 and his face is brown completely except for his eyes with just mud just running down his face and he's got his thumb up and this goofy grin it's a good is a like he's like i can't believe you post that picture of me dude i look ridiculous and it just but it was so real it connected incredibly well yeah um you know so that that kind of stuff even though it may not be advertising you know we you get stuck going, all right, well, what are the features and benefits of this tire? And how can we talk about it? And this, that, and the other. And, and, you know, we're lucky enough to work in a space where, um, especially if you're talking endemically where it's you like, we're all pretty passionate. So it's fine to just be passionate and be a fan at, at some points. Yeah. That's a good um, point. That's, you know, that's not, yeah, that's a, that's an awesome quote. I mean, because it sounds simple but i feel like i mean man so many people in this space forget that and there's some clients that we have that what makes them really really good business people is how analytical they are but they at times and they're good about this they catch themselves being too analytical and forgetting that man we got to remember how to connect with the audience and it's 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 doing a really good job of one passionate person communicating to another passionate person. So, right. um, that gets forgotten a lot. And I feel like in our industry, every, a lot, everybody for the most part, or the majority of the people that work in this industry are passionate about it. You, you, you know, yeah. people that sell cars, a lot of times they don't give a shit about the car. Like if you sell Dodges, you, they might drive a Toyota Corolla. Like yeah. in this sport, if you work in it, you probably really, really have a strong, place in your heart for motorcycles uh and that needs to come across in marketing yeah oh 100 having not worked in this industry for a substantial period of time um the stark just shocking you know wake up and refreshingness of having a sales someone call me on a sales call and we spend 15 minutes gushing over the race from the weekend yeah yeah like just to to for the most part encounter people that enjoy what they do are passionate about what they do you don't get that in every career sure. out there for sure and it's something it's something that it's easy to take for granted but is awesome yeah. and um you know it, it really really goes a long way uh to you know quality of life and and you know, I get a lot of, it's funny. I tell people that are like, ah, you don't, you know, when you're home, you just do family time. I'm like, dude, I get bro time all day yeah. at work. I get yeah. to bro down with people in the office. If I'm in the office, like you're talking to you, like this is a fun conversation right. about stuff I'm passionate about. Yeah. No so, doubt. you know, I get the blessing of, you know, having a lot of my friends be in industry. So a sales call is also a call with a buddy of mine, yeah. right? You don't get to do that in every, every, avenue you know every career yeah exactly um, yeah know, it's I spent a lot of time it's talking to people i couldn't stand in yeah. you know, in previous jobs and good and taking pride in the fact that they thought i really liked them <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's awesome yeah, yeah. i'm doing my job these guys yeah. think i like him i want to stab it <laughs> <You know? laughs> well man this has been awesome you're i think people are going to dig this you're you're a cool personality i remember i saw you on uh SGB's one of their supercross vlogs and your personality you're only on there for maybe 15 seconds and your personality came through I knew exactly who you were when Jason told me I needed to reach out to you so I think people are going to dig this um obviously encourage everybody to go check out what you guys are doing on your on your social and the website and things like that and uh man I look forward to connecting with you more in in the future and uh hopefully we'll have a reason to get you back on here one of these days and um yeah man I, I really appreciate you coming on 
yeah for sure it's been fun Luke. yeah we should uh yeah we should I'd, I'd be happy to hop back on let's let's pick something to deep dive into sometime yeah, like no topic doubt. just to go deep into that'd Absolutely. be rad Hey, before we go, I, I, I just got an email from Racer X, hot, hot off the press, the subscribe or renew offer for this month. Um, let me see if I can see how long this runs till. I don't know how long it runs till, but if, if you're listening to this episode and it's uh, in June, uh, it's, it's current. So um, subscribe or renew today. You get a... You get a free pair. If you subscribe or renew today, uh, you get a free pair of Racer X undies by Ethica. It's a $56 value. It's just 30 bucks. So that's pretty rad. Uh, so be sure to support racer X. Um, they, they give us this platform to bring cool guests to you. Um, like we did today. And, uh, I definitely appreciate it. So I'd appreciate it if you guys check them out. Um, my link for that, if you want to use our link, I'd appreciate that as well as racer forward slash moto marketing. And, uh, yeah, it would definitely help them out tremendously if you guys show support. Chris, I appreciate it, man. We'll definitely be in touch, and uh, I enjoyed having you on. Right on. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Same man. Here. Thank you for listening to the Moto Marketing Podcast. If your goal is to get real, measurable results from your marketing that will grow your company revenue, then check out how Impact Media can get the same results that they have for Moto's most iconic brands by visiting thinkimpact.com. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-M-P-A-K-T.com. Have a marketing question that you want answered on the show? Send your questions to questions at motomarketingpodcast.com. Don't forget to rate review and subscribe to the podcast and we'll catch you on the next episode of the moto marketing podcast